Welcome everybody to Rogue Reads. I am so happy to see so many faces tonight. And I was going to ramble a bit and give a long intro, but I can't because we have four fantastic authors and I, I just want to be able to turn things over to them. So let me just say on behalf of the Rogue Women Writers that we're all very happy you're joining us for Rogue Reads, our monthly event. Um, tonight, I am truly thrilled to introduce our four panelists in alphabetical order. I'll be going in alphabetical order the whole night. We have Walter Mosley. And Walter's new book is called Blood Grove. I'm going to just tell you very quickly about it because we want to hear Walter talk about it. But it's 1969, and Easy Rollins gets a visit from a white Vietnam veteran. He and his lover were attacked on the city's outskirts. He may have killed a man. And the woman and the dog, his dog, are now missing. Blood Grove is a crackling, moody, and thrilling race through a California of hippies and tycoons, radicals and sociopaths, cops and grifters, in a case that reveals the darkest impulses humans harbor. Next, we have Ed Ruggiero. Ed's new book is called Comes the War, and it's April 1944, the 55th month of the war in Europe. The entire island of Britain fairly buzzes with the coiled energy of a million men poised to leap the channel to France. Lieutenant Eddie Harkins is tasked to investigate the murder of Helen Batch of Helen, an OSS analyst. Soon a suspect is arrested and Harkins is ordered to stop digging. Suspicious, he continues his investigation only to find himself trapped in a web of Soviet secrets. Dana Stabenow has a new Liam Campbell out. New on Ham is an icebound bit bush town with a six bed jail, a busted ATM, and a saloon that does double duty as a courtroom. And Liam Campbell has been exiled from Anchorage to this outpost in disgrace. Campbell didn't expect the job he's going to get to be simple, and it isn't. From the literally cutthroat business of commercial fishing to the paranoid misanthropy of the backcountry prospector, drug dealers, serial killers, and caches of forgotten war gold, he's gonna have his hands full. And last but definitely not least, we're honored to have both Charles and Caroline Todd, the Charles Todd Foundation with us tonight. Their latest, Ian Rutledge, is called A Fatal Lie. A peaceful Welsh village is thrown into turmoil when a terrified boy, terrified boy stumbles on a body in a nearby river. And when Inspector Rutledge is sent from London to find answers, he has given few clues. Looking for the truth, Rutledge uncovers a web of lies swirling around a suicidal woman, a child's tragic fate, another woman bent on protecting her past. And where among all those lies lies the motive for murder? So a big wel welcome to Walter and Ed and Dana and Charles and Caroline tonight. I would like each of you to begin, and again, we'll go in alphabetical order. Tell us a little more about the new books than I just did with the, uh, you know, the flap copy. So, Walter, can we start with you and tell us a little bit about um, your newest, Easy Rollins? It's the 15th, I believe. You have to unmute, Walter. I forgot it was on mute. Uh, I, I was so good to obey, and <laughs> not to come back. Um, the, you know, this is a, a book a lot about uh, ease. It's about it's about war, and about a response to war. About you know about individual responses to war, and it's a lot about uh, identity, uh, about how how broad identity, you know, so, so much, so many times that we, we'll take a group of people and we'll say, well, this people has, you know, do this and, and the, and these people do that. Uh, and, uh, that's the way they are. And that's the way we define them. And that's the way we put them in our movies and talk about them and etc. And, you know, easiest notion of himself, even though he's this, uh, you know, a black man, uh, in Los Angeles, he's, he's from the South. He's uh, a private detective. Uh, he's, uh, a father, a single father, uh, and uh, and also he's a veteran, and and a lot of in this book is about him because he's a veteran trying to uh, r respond uh, to this young white uh, veteran from Vietnam who he knows it's good not to try to find out 
what happened with this guy. His nose is good for the guy not to find out, but he gets pulled into a case anyway. And as often is the case, once, once you get involved, once you start uh, trying to find out who did what, you actually have to work it through to the end. And so, you know, that's pretty much what my book is about. Blood Girls, the latest easier odds. Um, I think I'm a little starstruck by the authors here, so I have to backtrack a tiny bit and um, give you all the format for tonight so you'll sort of know what's happening. Um, so Walter, is go we're gonna go in alphabetical order, as I said, each author will have the chance to speak for, you know, about 10 minutes. And if they are so inclined, they do not have to, but they can also uh, favor us with a short reading. If they don't choose to read, then I just have a few more questions prepared to ask each author. And authors really like to do both on Rogue Read, so there's no pressure either way. Um, so Walter, thank you for kicking things off. I also want to say yeah. that here on Rogue Reads, we're, we're big you know, drinkers, both dry and soft. And um, we always ask our authors for their favorite drinks. And the host gets the very fun privilege of sort of mocking up each of the author's drinks. So as I said, I'm backtracking a little. That's, that's my bad. But Walter's drink of choice, I think I have it right, is mineral water. I added some lime, Walter. Um, so thank you for telling us about blood growth. And as I say, we will be moving on to each author alphabetically. But Walter, I want to ask a few questions of you, you know, that really get into some of your career and your life as a writer as well. Um, the first, which I'd like to start with, is that your work, both in terms of themes and questions, and in terms of your life, you know, and activism, the publishing certificate program I was reading about, it really deals with issues that have always been pressing. And now, maybe are in a different way on the national stage, maybe they're not, but can you talk a little bit about how you've married life as a creative with issues of social justice? both in the Easy Rollins, which you've already touched on, series, but in general as well. Well, you know, I mean, the thing I like the most about being a writer is writing. I, I, I love that. I love writing. I love talking about uh, people and places, people and places, lives and culture. Uh, and you know, one of the things that, that no matter what kind of writer you are, either you're completely making up the world that somebody's in, or you're talking about a world that people live in. So like, if you're going to write about a, a, a woman who wants to be a detective in 1902, uh, there's some you know, things that are true. She can't vote. Uh, she can't really uh, control property she owns. Uh, she uh, is, uh, if she's married, she's, she's going to be submissive to her husband. If she's not, she's going to be a victim in many things in, in life. And so if I was to write about that, that uh, woman, uh, regardless of her you know, background, uh, whatever, um, I would have to, those things would have to appear now and again, just to, just to understand why she does and doesn't do, do certain things. Um, so it becomes political. You know, it, it doesn't you know, say you know, where you're coming from, whatever. Me writing about black people in America, um, there's a lot that, that goes on that, that most people don't know. And um, they get, they'll get, um, they might even get upset about when, when you write about it. I remember I was once talking to Jonathan Demme and he said, I always wanted to work with Easy Rollins. I said, but you know, he's just talking about race all the time. It's, you know, it's, you know it, it's a little too much, don't you think? And I said, yeah, it's too much, but hey. So you're saying there is no real line and even when somebody as creative as a great director looks from the outside and thinks there is a line, that line doesn't exist. Yeah, no, it's true. And, you know, so I'm, I'm writing. I, I, I'm, the th main thing is I want to tell the story about my characters, who they yeah. are, what they are, where they're going. Um, but at the same time, I have to, you know, be, be true to the, the world that I'm living in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you open the door to talk about page to stage, page to screen, which I am fascinated about. I think everybody who knows Walter Wolf mostly is. So let me let me see if I've got this right. Um, you're a writer and an executive producer on Snowfall, mm -hmm. which is John Singleton's show. Yeah. yeah. And um, your very first Easy Rollins, Rollins was Devil in a Blue Dress, and that was made into a film. And it stars um, my friend, I like to call him Denzel, even though I've never met him and, you know, don't know, but I feel like I do. And um, another great of our time, John, Don Cheadle. Can you tell us a little bit about how your life as a page word creator 
has translated to the Hollywood and screen landscape. Well, you know, so many movies are based on books anyway. I mean, either directly or, or indirectly. Uh, I, I think, you know, the, the literature uh, that, you know, we writers, you know, writers of books create uh, ha have a great uh, presence in, in film. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people out, out here in Los Angeles, you know, and uh, who actually do a lot of reading and are are influenced by the books and, and make films. You know, I, I made uh, Devil in a Blue Dress. I didn't I didn't do anything. I sold it uh, to 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 Jonathan, actually Jonathan Deming, and and he and he and he you know, got Carl Franklin there, and and you know, and they and they all work together. Um, and and then I, I I actually did write and executive produce a film that I made for um, uh, for HBO, uh, always outnumbered, always outgunned about Socrates Fortlow star. You know, Michael Apted directed, Lawrence Fishburne starred. Uh, Cicely Tyson was in there. It was, it was a, that was a lot of fun. I'm doing right now. I mean, I'm working, of course, on Snowfall, but also I'm, I'm working with, um, um, uh, with, with, with Sam Jackson uh, over at Apple TV, making a mini series out of my book, uh, The Last Days of Ptolemy Gray. Um, it, it's, it's, it, you know, it's, and when I say working, it's, it's, it's a job. It's, it's kind of a, a glittery job, you know, but. You know, glitter doesn't keep you up at night. You know, you have to have electric light somewhere. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm completely. You know, it's really fun. You know, and it's also a good way to supplement one's income. It's, it's nice. Which industry do you think is nicer, publishing or uh, Hollywood? I think writing, uh, prose in, yeah. in books and novels is is the best thing to do. Uh, yeah. Both Hollywood. Uh, and publishing are uh, backstabbing in, in a <laughs> lot of ways, um, and, and they're not necessarily aware of the ways that you know uh, of the, the the pressure they put on people, the amount of yeah. power they give to people. But um, you know, I'm I'm not too worried about the, the the industry as much as I am about the art. So, okay, thank you. Fair, fair. So let's spend with with the last few minutes we get to have Walter Solo. And then I'm hoping that at the end of the night, there'll be questions for all of our panelists. But um, let's talk a little bit about uh, historical novels, which I know that at least two of our panelists have, have more to speak to. But, you know, I was thinking about uh, Blood Grove and the, the log line for it. And it said, it, you know, it's 1969. And I was like, historical novel. Is that a historical novel? Because like, I don't know if I want to tell you guys that I, I was there for 1969. But let's just say it wasn't very far off. So do you consider yourself, and, and really the series starts as far back as, I think, 1930 something, right? So do you consider yourself a historical novelist, or do you feel like you're writing about times that were just, just around the last corner? Well, you know, th there are two moments in history, right? There's two minutes ago, which, you know, you know is history. And then there's the time beyond any living being's memory. I'm not writing about times as a rule beyond any living being's memory. Um, I wrote one science fiction-ish novel uh, about uh, a slave plantation, plantation in 1842, but it's not history because, you know. Anyway, uh, so, no, I don't, I don't really consider them historical, but I, but, but I also, I mean, cause you know, there's a thing about history you don't belong to um, the, the the consciousness of your world unless you exist in the literature. So if if somebody if if somebody's not writing fiction about you and your experiences and people that you've known, if if somebody's not doing that, then they're they don't exist in history. So in a way, I'm creating moments because I, I'm writing about characters who. People have written about Los Angeles in uh, 69, 59, 49, 39, but they haven't written about the parts, uh, much about the parts of Los Angeles that I'm, I'm writing about, and certainly not in, in, in the same depth. Um, and so, you know, myself and a few other writers have actually, you know, opened up a moment in history, you know, I'm putting that in, in quotes, you know, because mm -hmm. we're talking about something that said, oh, really? 
Right. So when you were writing Blood Growth, did you feel as if you had to actually do research to steep yourself in a time gone by, or did it come to you naturally out of the fabric of your memories and your existence and your character? You know, I, I, I'm unusual from many of my friends who are writers. I don't know about all writers, but many of my friends who are writers, in, in as much as I hate teaching and I hate research. <laughs> I just hate it. I hate it. So I say, I'm going to say, I'm going to write this book. So, well, here's, here's 15 books you can read before you write that book. And I'm going, no, I don't want to do that. Well, listen, we, I can get you newspapers from all over the country at, on that day. And I go, well, that's fine, but I don't want to, you know. And, but I do, after I finish writing something, go back and make sure that everything I said is more or less accurate or at least can't be disproven, you know. That's fascinating because I hear so many writers and, and I wonder even if some of our panelists tonight will have a different approach. You say that the research is the fun part and they have to tear themselves away from it to begin writing. So. I know, yeah. Thank you, Walter, thank you. All right, let's move on through the alphabet, which I am going to tell you guys, because you know it's such an intimate Zoom night, that when I first sent the lineup to our wonderful rogues, Chris and uh, Lisa, I got the alphabet wrong and I mixed up the order. That's very bad for a writer. You never want to see that. Um, so thank you, Walter. Ed Ruggiero, let us move on to you. You have a fascinating background because you've studied practice and taught leadership for more than 25 years and your clients include the FBI, the CIA, um, NYPD, I kept wanting to say NYPD Blue, I think that was because I was still on Walter's television experience. Um, so I, I have a question about that, but let's, and I talked a little bit about Comes the War, which is your new book. So let's open by you telling us a little bit more about Comes the War, describe it better than I did. And uh, then we'll move on to some specific questions. And Ed's drink is beer, it had a really nice head on it. It's gone flat, but I promise it's actual beer. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Comes to War is the second book in, in this particular series, and the uh, protagonist is Eddie Harkins. Um, he's not a very lucky guy. Um, he's an unlikely hero, a flawed hero, but that made him a lot of fun to write about. Um, he's a college dropout. Um, he's also the smallest and least attractive of his uh, brothers. Um, his mother is angry at him because he got his youngest brother into the Navy. This is during World War II, and she does not write to Eddie. Um, he dropped out of uh, Villanova University, which is here in Philadelphia, uh, at the suggestion of the head of the school um, because he got in a fight. He became a Philadelphia police officer, not a detective, just a police officer, um, and joined the Army days after Pearl Harbor to get away from a suspicious husband. Uh, of a woman he'd been just friendly with. Um, he does not have a girlfriend to write to. Uh, the closest he came uh, was Kathleen Donnelly in the book, Blame the Dead, which is the first book. She's an army nurse who also grew up in the same Philadelphia neighborhood. She's a little bit older than him. She's very accomplished. He's a little bit in awe of her, um, but she tells him it's not time to get serious. And she's in Italy and he's in England when this story takes place. He's got one murder investigation in his uh, past, but. It didn't go very well, but he is relentless um, for better or worse. He stays on a case uh, long after others smarter than he is uh, have told him it's, it's time to give up. And, and comes the war, he's uh, surprised at his assignment to the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which is the forerunner of the CIA. Um, but he never volunteered to be a spy. He doesn't speak French or German. He can't figure out why he's there. Um, he wants to complete his service with nothing to brag about and uh, nothing to be ashamed of. And yet, he constantly finds himself in situations uh, that make it difficult to achieve that goal. Um, in Comes the War, um, I, I have a short piece I was going to read from Comes the War. He's on a training exercise, part of the landing on the English coast in April of 1944. Uh, that was shot up by German patrol boats. This is a true story. So I was going to read you a little piece of that, if that's okay. Um, Please do. Okay. And we'll bounce back to you, Walter, later, if you'd like to read as well, because I realized I forgot that. Go ahead, Red. Okay. And take it away, because I love hearing the reading. I got it, Cortizo shouted. He managed to inflate the life belt, though the top chamber was not as full of the bottom. We have to go over the side, Harkin said. He could see Cortizo's mouth move, but could not hear him over the rush of flames and crash of vehicles tearing loose from their bindings and tumbling towards the starboard rail. It's a big jump, Cortizo said. 
It's only going to get higher, Harkins screamed, just an inch from the man's face. I'll go first. Harkins forced himself upright, lifted one foot to the rail, and that's when he saw the tra trapped men. He was facing aft toward the superstructure. Near the base and on the starboard side, there was a hatch, open only a few inches. But in the firelight, Harkins could see that there was a man, no two men, maybe three, pushing the door from the inside, trying to force it open. One man had stuck his leg through, the door pinching him. Harkins put his foot back on the deck. You go first, he said to Cortizo. The sergeant, sh the sergeant shook his head, mouth open. You have to help me when we get to the water. Harkins did not want to tell Cortizo that he was going alone. You go first, and then I can dive in beside you to help. Your life belt will keep you afloat. afloat. To reinforce this point, he tugged at the inflated belt, pulled it snug around Cortizo's waist. Cortigo Cortizo gave his head a violent shake, said something in Spanish, maybe a prayer. Harkins pried Cortizo's finger from the rail and the man rolled down the side of the hull and into the black water. Harkins hugged the port rail as he moved aft toward the superstructure and the trapped men. He grabbed the edge of the door, which was hot to the touch and pulled backward. When it didn't budge, he used all of his weight, hoping that it wouldn't give way so suddenly that he'd fall into the water behind him. Nothing. On his first pass by the superstructure, he'd seen a long handled wrench secured in a binding at the base of the bridge. It was one of the tools the sailors used to tighten the chains locking cargo to the deck. He unhooked the clasp and pulled it free, slid down the deck toward the trapped men, and when he reached the hatch and stood, he was in water up to his calves. Harkins heard a man inside the hatch yell, he's back, he's back. He struggled to get his footing, braced himself on the lip of a locker and started banging away at the bent dogs. Three hard swings and the first handle snapped off. He took a big swing at the last bent one, which popped off and hit him on the side of his face. The men inside pushed and the hatch swung open, spilling them like tossed trash. The third sailor out offered his hand to pull Harkins up, shouted, thanks. Another man, a Navy ensign, was still in the opening. Come on, Harkins yelled. I need help, the officer said. The ensign, one hand on either side of the hatch, leaned back so that Harkins could see inside the companionway. Another sailor lay on the deck, one leg braced on the bulkhead to keep him from sliding, the other leg gone at the knee and tied off with a crude tourniquet. Harkins climbed inside and, though he would never remember how they did it, he and the ensign got the wounded sailor out onto the deck, up and over the port rail. The Navy men had life belts and Harkins found one floating in the water, already inflated. He held it as they paddled about 100 yards towing the wounded man who was now unconscious. They stopped and as Harkins struggled to wrap the life bolt around himself, the ensign shouted, under your armpits. What? If you put it around your waist, it'll flip you over and you'll drown. Harkins got the belt around his chest and had only a second to enjoy the relief before he thought of Staff Sergeant Jesus Cortizo, non-swimmer, going over the side, life belt snug around his waist where Harkins had so helpfully tightened it. So thank you for that reading. Um, I love some of those details like the black water that just put you right there. So I guess I would ask you at the same question as Walter got a little bit, which is it's the 55th month of the war. I didn't even know, like, you know, I wasn't even thinking of the war being counted that way. But of course, if you're in that world, the way Harkins is, and you are counting month by month. So tell us a little bit about the process of putting yourself back into 1944 and the creating that on the page and, and like you did so well with the words. Well, uh, thank you. I've, I've often read military history. I have a military background um, and I've read a lot of military history. I've written nonfiction about World War II. Um, so I'm sort of steeped in that. Uh, writing fiction let me go in and, and choose the story and then tell more about a particular story that I didn't necessarily know about, but um, I could piece together from little little pieces that I'd found everywhere else. Uh, and that that helped me um, that helped me put it in perspective. It's it's important for American audiences to know that this war had already gone on for a long, long time. Uh, most Americans, especially back here in the States, uh, my parents, um, the war started for them in 1944. Right. Uh, yeah, not so much for the British, though. 
Yeah, no, I was thinking of that, that, you know, of course, because it wasn't on American soil, you could insulate yourself from it to a degree. So um, in keeping with the military background, and I, I know you are a graduate of West Point and taught there as well, um, the late great Tom Clancy offered you some ageless advice as I, I was when I was reading about you. Can you share it? And often at Rogues, we have a lot of emerging writers reading. Uh, watching. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that advice and how the role it played in your career and maybe the applicability you think it still does have or does not have today. Yeah, uh, Tom Clancy was already a famous author on the cover of Newsweek. I was a captain. Uh, I was teaching, happened to be teaching at West Point at the time. Uh, I wrote him a letter. Hey, I'm Captain Tentpeg. Love to have you come to West Point. I'll show you around, you know, and uh, he accepted my invitation, uh, which was interesting because the superintendent, a three-star general, had invited him twice and been turned down twice. Nevertheless, oh. he accepted my invitation and I did show him around. Um, he came and he talked to my class in particular, which was about 15 cadets. And um, he told them that, um, you know, you, there's always this story that's in, in front of your consciousness um, you just have to be able to, to sort through it and, and get to that story um, if you're, if you're going to tell it rightly. And don't be afraid. Um, he said a lot of people have those kinds of stories, but don't want to share them because it's hard to get published. He goes, but share it because you want to share it and, and you'll be fine whether you get published or not. Mm. And do you feel like that had a pivotal role when you writing the first book? It absolutely did. <laughs> I, I wrote... Uh, I, I, had, I guess I'd already started writing my first novel um, and I wrote to Clancy and uh, thanked him. Um, I, and I sent him a hundred pages, which is yeah. totally wrong, but I didn't know any better. And uh, I sent him this, this part of the manuscript and it was paper and it was uh, you know, in a box. And he called me at home and said, well, I, I tried to get you, it was a Saturday but couldn't find you. So I called my agent at his home and he's going to call you on Monday. And that, <laughs> that was a big deal for me. I presented by Clancy's agent for my first five novels. And yeah, that was a big deal. 1,100 people are now thinking to write letters with pages. Dear Ed, <laughs> thank you, Ed. That is wonderful. And as I say, we are going to keep hopping around and we'll come back. And, and Walter, since I, I did... Um, have a terrible oversight and not ask you to read, even though I would love to hear you. Think about whether you'd like to. But we are going to move on to Dana now. Thrilled to have Dana Stabenow with us. Is that right? ST. Yeah, I seriously have to, this is how starstruck I am. I have to check myself on the, on the alphabet. So Dana, um, in some ways, Dana, I think that writing was supposed to be the easier path for you because you were raised in a way that was very uh, cold and wet and hard. And when I was reading over your bio, I thought that's funny. Writing was supposed to be the easier path. I don't know if everybody would agree with that. But I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about Spoils of the Dead, which is a Liam Campbell um, mystery. And I know you write two series and everybody knows Kate Shudak, but I would really love you to tell us about Spoils of the Dead. Stana here. Hi, Stana I muted. muted. I muted it because okay. the dog was going off in the background. Sorry. First That's of all, good. let me tell you that writing is never the easier way. <laughs> <laughs> it's just warmer and drier. That's all. <laughs> um, as far as Spoils of the Dead is concerned, um, it is the fifth Liam Campbell novel. It's been 16 years since I wrote in the uh, Liam Campbell series. Although I did visit, I did have uh, Kate Chugak in the 19th Kate Chugak novel um, go to Newenham to work a case that Liam ethically could not work himself because his wife was involved. Right. So um, when I revisited those characters, I thought, well, okay, those are still pretty good characters. I'm still interested in their lives. I wonder what's happening to them next. And I um, just last year, I guess it was, um, uh, wrote Spoils of the Dead, which is more realistic in that when the Liam Campbell story first started, Liam was in a very, very bad place. Newenham was his last best hope of um, uh, his surviving mentally, emotionally in his career. And he made good there. And um, 
I was always acutely conscious that it wasn't realistic of him to stay in one place because Alaska State Troopers, there's only 243 of them and they move around a lot. Generally, a state trooper will wind up in a place like Newenham because their retirement is based on the pay they get from their last posting. And of course, the um, Bush postings, you get paid more because they're hard, it's harder to get out of. Less, I'm not gonna use the word civilized, but certainly it's just, it's like way the hell and gone away from everything else. So I was acutely conscious of that when I was writing the Liam Campbell novels. And again, when I re visited the characters um, in Restless in the Grave, which was the 19th Kate Chubeck novel in which those characters appear. And I thought the natural thing to do was to move him. So I moved him. Now he's living on the road system, which of course is going to come with its own problems, which are massive and different. Um, for one thing, I have never written a great deal in Alaska, in the books about Alaska, about the tourism industry. And I can see that there would be many areas um, for available for con conflict there. Um, and also in, there's this continuing argument in Alaska, resource extraction versus lifestyle. And all you have to do is put two people on a street corner in any town in Alaska and you'll start a fight by just by introducing the subject. Um, so that of course, I'm, Spoils of the Dead is a different way of looking at that conflict. And, the, and sort of the rift between inside or outside or kind of, you know, in the culture. Inside or out, well, it's not really, I, I, not this book necessarily. It doesn't have any, if you're speaking of outside with a capital O. No, okay. no, no, I was speaking oh, yeah. okay. of <laughs> No, yeah. what I was interested in, in in a lot of your work, I think, is that there's a culture to Alaska that people who don't know it, I think most of the people who come from away think of Alaska as Alaska, the one entity, whereas you really delve into nuances and shades of difference between this vast landscape that most people know, perhaps only as, you know, where where did I take the, uh, the plane out of or where did I take the cruise by? And I was, I was just thinking about the ways in which you you know, are in the bush and in the uh, wilderness, and that becomes almost a character in the book itself. Alaska is always probably the primary character in all of the Liam Campbell and the um, Kate Chugak novels. No yeah. question. Yeah. 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 So talk to us a little bit about the early days, your publication journey. I know you said warmer and drier and writing's not easy, but I think probably some people looking at Dana Stavano do think like, you know, dozens of books and all this success and the, you know, awards and, and tell us a little bit about your journey as a writer and, you know, to become uh, Dana Stavano now. Well, I was always going to be a journalist. My teachers, I had some minuscule amount of talent in writing. And so I was raised in a very small town, very small high school. There are only five in my graduating class. And the, they, they always pushed me toward journalism because they wanted me to have a job. They were good people. I don't, you know, it, and it didn't occur to me either that I might actually make a living out of writing fiction. So when I went to school, I went at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, I got a journalism degree, but I graduated in 1973. And unfortunately, just about that time, the oil was discovered and was they were building in Prudhoe Bay and they were building the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. And everybody in the world came to Alaska to get a job, very high paying jobs. Everybody wanted to come here and go to work. And you know, the construction project was only gonna last depending on which part of it you work from three to five years. So, hey, anybody could put up, any outsider could put up with Alaska. Alaska for long enough to, you know, make bank and then book. So, okay. But the problem was I graduated from college in the middle of all this. The only journalism job I could find was a copy editor, job as copy editor at the Anchorage Times, and it only paid $800 a month. And you couldn't even pay the rent on the take home from that. So I did what everybody else did. I went to work on the slope. <laughs> I went to work on the pipeline. First, I worked for Alaska, and then I worked for um, BP in Prudhoe Bay. And along about 1982, I had enough savings to where I was able to ask myself, well, hmm, possibly I should try this writing thing and see if I can make it work. So I went back to college. I got my master's degree. And my goal was to write a book and get it published with my name spelled correctly on the cover before I ran out of savings. And I just barely made it. I think I had something like $1,100 in the bank when my first book was published. <laughs> now, are you talking about, because are you talking about A Cold Day for Murder? Or there was another book in a totally different genre, right? That 
Can I wrote you... science fiction. I wrote okay. science fiction. Yeah, I wrote three. The first two, sci I've written three science fiction novels. The first two were published before the A Cold Day for Murder. Okay. When my, my editor bought A Cold Day for Murder in that wonderful way that editors always do, when they buy your first novel, they say, what else have you got? Knowing that there, we always have something else. And um, I just happened to have this manuscript imaginatively titled Mystery, <laughs> which um, I sent off to her and that's A Cold Day for Murder. Okay, and then Blindfold Game, you think of as a thriller. Talk a little bit, I guess, Dana, I would love to hear, and I think a lot of our emerging writers out there too, would love to hear some of your thoughts on genre and how genre breaks down in the industry and whether those are good boxes that we should be trying to fit ourselves into. Your work in some ways, I think, straddles in some ways feels very traditional mystery. Can you talk a little bit about where you see your work is fitting and maybe the question of genre overall? Man, I don't know if it fits anywhere. I, you know, I'm not sure, you know, I can say with certainty um, <laughs> that, that you can, I, I really don't like labels, but I know, and labels, I think mostly facilitate sales, you know, publishers, they'll, they'll peg you as in a genre so that they can peg that audience. And it makes sense. I understand that, but um, I don't like being confined as far as the creative part is concerned. I don't like being confined to any one genre. And so I've written thrill. I've written two thrillers. I've written a lot of crime fiction. I've written three science fiction novels and now I'm writing historical fiction. So I, and also I think it's a really good idea to exercise your muscle in different genres. It's a really good idea for every writer to do that. You said that a lot of aspiring authors listen to this show. Well, I would tell them to, no matter how scared you are, no matter how much you believe you can't do it, to like make the jump from say crime fiction into historical fiction, you know, you can always edge your way into that by writing history into like Walter is doing and like Ed is doing, um, write history into the book you're currently writing. I mean, one of the first times I ever included history in one of my Kate Chugach novels was I think The Singing of the Dead when I had a double narrative going on, one in the present and one in the past. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I did it again in Though Not Dead, which is the, uh, I think the 18th Kate Chugach novel. Um, so you can edge your way in there. You can gain confidence. Um, remember, you still have to tell a story that people want to read. Um, and then maybe just go whole hog after the fact, if you want to, if you enjoy it, if it's fun. If it's not fun for you, it's not going to be fun for the reader. I, yeah, I do think that's very liberating advice. And I think a lot of the writers out there probably who do feel a little confined will be glad to hear that. So thank you, Dana. Dana's drink, by the way, is uh, lager. Am I right, Dana? You, I don't know how you found that out, but you are exactly right. <laughs> um, thank you. All right, let's move on to our mother-son team. We're lucky enough to have both Charles and Caroline Todd with us today in one, well, not in one place, but in one Zoom place. Uh, Charles and Caroline will have to duke it out for in terms of uh, telling us a little bit more about the latest Ian Rutledge, which is A Fatal Lie. I told you a little bit about it, but I would love to hear them uh, elaborate a bit on my description. And uh, then we'll get into some questions and then we'll circle back around and ask if um, Walter and or Charles and Caroline might like to read, but take it away with A Fatal Lie. Well, <clears throat> Ian Rutledge is in disgrace at the yard. And so he is sent to a um, very simple case in North Wales where all he has to do is identify a body and possibly find the person who, who killed the man. He gets there and the case explodes into something that he never expected to have to deal with. Everyone he meets tells lies. Everyone he meets has secrets. What he has to do is find out in amongst all these lies, which one was a fatal lie? Which one sent a good and decent man to his death in Wales? And that was the premise we started with. Had a great deal of fun traveling from one place to another, looking at all the possible settings as we always do. And, um, it turned out to be a rather exciting book to write. It's interesting to feel the excitement even with a very well-established series with tons of fans, but that spark still, still comes. So yeah, I was very interested in the idea of um, a good man dying and, um, and, and the title I thought tied in beautifully. Let me raise a glass to Caroline. Hold on, everybody. 
Caroline's drink. Is it a black Russian? Oh, it looks good. <laughs> I wish I could share it with you. And then Charles's drink, yum. I'm going to lick the rim. It's a virgin mojito. So tell us a little bit. I mean, this ends up being apropos of all of our panelists. And you do love the, the travel. The travel is a huge part of both of your processes. You go to these places and you've said on, you know, different of your materials that you're going to a different country, you're going to a different time. In some ways, there's even a different language spoken there. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like? And um, then I'm going to get to the question that everybody wants to ask the Todds and I've heard you asked it before, but I, I figure it changes. But tell us a little bit about the travel and the research and how that manifests in your lives and then in the uh, novels as well, both series. And uh, I think that's the truly enjoyable part. We have loved England a lot longer than we were, have been writers. So we've been traveling all around England for a, a long time and it's, it's amazing because it's sort of like Dana was describing about Alaska. It's my, we think of it in the United States as being monolithic and it's not. Uh, you can go from Norfolk to uh, Cornwall and the, the language, the customs, the personalities uh, are completely different, just as if you went from Arizona to Philadelphia. And by going there, you're able to pick up on the nuances of how the land is formed, what it looks like, how what effect that had on the people who lived there, how they sustain themselves over history, the development of the different cultures based on outside influences as well as inside influences. And uh, this was no different. Uh, Shropshire is in a wonderful place because it's, it was right on the border of England and Wales and a scene of a, a tremendous amount of feudal warfare. And so that history is just soaked into the ground. So getting to travel is uh, a lot of fun, but it still comes down to the core of coming up with the idea first. In this case, it was the lie and how Rutledge is forced to go through and, and figure out which lie is which and what's covering up what he's looking for and it's amazing how once we tell one lie, it develops into another lie and another lie and another lie. Yeah, it's a real domino row. Um, I was entranced by the description of a little boy and then also, you know, entranced in the thriller writer sense, which is horrified, but you know, you're, you're sort of glued to the idea. So I'm wondering if the water, and was that, an image that you actually saw as you're on your meanderings or was that imagination? And how does actually what you're seeing and doing when you're traveling, how much of that ends up on the page and how much it's just kind of a shadow behind the story when you actually sit down to write? Well, we went everywhere that uh, we use in the story. And the, the real, um, the interesting thing for us was to take the narrowboat ride over the Telford Aqueduct mm -hmm. in Wales. That's, most aqueducts carry water in a 12 inch um, trough. This was a 12 foot wide up. Six of it's water, six feet is for the horse that used to, in the past, pull the boats along. They have motors now. <laughs> It's 12 feet, you're sitting on the top of, of the, the in boat on the water. There's this walkway beside you, and there's 120 feet down to the River D below. And you look over. I'm going to interrupt for a second. This is the actual oh. aqueduct we're talking about that's on the front. Absolutely. And Shameless promotion. It's <laughs> beautiful, though. We took that little journey across. 
And someone asked if we wanted to walk back and we said, no, <laughs> take the boat back. But what a wonderful place to kill somebody. <laughs> well, and this is one of the things that we, we find when we're, we're traveling. It's, it's what this now boat culture meant in history, but it's also an opportunity to, to have a crime that seems to have no beginning and no end, just a body found in the river by a little boy who's terrified by what he sees. And from there, the story began to, to develop. We use the um, Bantam Battalions, which were um, um, not a part of World War I, but an important part. We used um, uh, all sorts of the quarry. I took the, the huge, um, I guess you would call it a lorry, with wheels bigger than, than me. Um, up through the, the excavated quarry where you could look down deep into the hole below where Charles was also underground doing the same trip into the, the heart of the quarry. So all of these things came into the story and we could see how the characters would fit these situations and what they would do in them. And that, that, that blend of a character and the setting and the, the possibility for murder and for adventure is what really makes these trips come alive. Yeah, I can imagine. So Charles and Caroline Todd, I was uh, lucky enough, I think it might only have been Charles who was there, but I was at an event at the Brooklyn Public Library many years ago. Laura Littman was also on the panel. So I know this is a question you get asked a lot, but I also know from hearing from people who are gonna be here tonight that they're interested. How does a mother and son get to write to best-selling series, and I think two standalones. If I'm wrong on any of the details, forgive me. But how does that come to be? And, you know, I know some people are like, my mother, I, I couldn't sit in a room with my mother, let alone, and I know you don't sit in the same room, but how does this come to be? This is a career path. Charles or Caroline, please answer. Well, it started, uh, actually, it's, it's funny. Tessa Wells came out 25 years ago this year and was our first book. And uh, it started a couple of years before that. Uh, I was living in North Carolina at the time and our love of historical places is not limited to England. Uh, Kings Mountain Battlefield is just south of Charlotte right there on the border between North and South Carolina. And uh, was the scene of a rather bloody battle uh, that led on sort of as a domino effect uh, that ultimately wound up in Yorktown. But we're visiting that and there is a mystery about a, a man who was supposed to be miles away from there, an English officer who got killed during that battle. And there's some question about whether he, it was a friendly fire or killed by the enemy. And uh, we talked about it and I was driving back home and Caroline said to me, you know, as much as we like history and as much as we enjoy mysteries, we should try to write a mystery. And uh, I'm driving on the interstate and <laughs> you know, sure, fine, whatever, I don't care. And uh, it wasn't until later when my job changed, I started working on the road with same company, but my role was different. I was a operations analyst. And so I spent a lot of time on the road and in hotels. And so I contacted Caroline and asked her if she was serious. And really, honestly, it was a lark to see if we could do it, number one. And number two, see if we could figure out how we could do it. It took us a long time to figure out uh, how to do this collaboration thing. There was no collaboration for dummies book out there. <laughs> Is there now? Will that be written maybe by roughly the first nonfiction? Um, thank you. I mean, I, I know everybody is fascinated by 
that element of your processes. So I, I would like to circle back. And I know you. everybody, Dana had to hop off and it was wonderful to have her here. Dana yeah. did let me know that she's not um, the biggest fan of reading anyway. So I think as we move on to this portion, it, it was a good time if Dana had to duck out. So Charles and Caroline and Walter, just um, give me a, you know, a hands up if you would like to read a short excerpt, really just two to three minutes from the latest. Would we like to hear something from A Fatal Lie or from Blood Grove? And if you would like to read, you know, let me know somehow. I don't see Walter's picture anymore. Let me see. But Charles or Caroline, do you like to read? Walter's well, there. Read? He's, I think he wants to read. He oh yeah, like yeah, I'd, I'd love to read. read. I mean, it would be fun. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, yeah, I mean, a, a, a short uh, piece. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'll, I'll just start, start off and I'll, and I'll read this. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a short part. It's, it's where Easy uh, meets his client. There was a sound out past the hallway toward the front of the offices. One of the settling cracks of the foundation, most probably. But then again, maybe there was no sound at all and just my intuition. I looked up and saw the shadow of a man standing a few feet back from the doorway, the only exit from my office. Go to the left or go to the right, but never move straight ahead unless there's no other way, Mr. Chen often taught in his self-defense class. Look for the upper hand instead of trying to prove that you are the strongest. The other man is always stronger, but you will best him from either the right or the left. The problem was that I was sitting in a chair at a desk with my closest pistol in the bottom drawer. Whoever had walked in was good. He hardly made a sound. Even if I fell to the right and grabbed at the drawer, he could have shot me right through the wood. He took a step forward. I could see that he was tall and lean with a pantherish gait, but still his features were hidden in shadow. Are you easy, Rawlins? He asked. With those words, the unannounced visitor crossed the threshold. He was in his early 20s with very short sandy blonde hair and an ugly bruise on his left temple. He wore a peach and white checkered sh short sleeve shirt over a white undershirt. His blue jeans were stiff ending in silent white sneakers. I already knew he was a white boy by the spin of his words. You always just uh, walk in on people like that, I replied. The door was unlocked, he said, and I, I said hello when I came in. He took another step and I sat back again. His empty hands hung loose at the sides. I'm Rollins, who are you? He took another step saying, Craig Killian, one more step. I felt as if he was gonna walk right up on my desk. Why don't you take a seat, Mr. Killian? The offer seemed to confuse the young man. He, he looked to his left, identified the walnut straight back chair. After a moment, he went through the necessary movements to sit himself down. You just out the military, Craig? Uh-huh, uh, you, you say that because of my crew cut? Yeah, sure. There was a haunted look in Killian's eyes that would have probably still been there even if he hadn't been walloped upside the head. All through World War II, I'd encountered soldiers from both sides of the battlefield who had that look, who had been shattered by the din of war. Craig took out a pack of true cigarettes from his shirt pocket. Plucking out a cancer stick with his lips, he drew a book of matches from the cellophane skin of the pack. He lit up, took in a lungful of smoke, and exhaled. Then he gave me a quizzical look and asked, do you mind if I smoke? I did mind. I've been trying to quit for a couple of years, but there was something about Craig's glower that made me want to give him some leeway. There. Great. <clears throat> Panthers, gay and silent white sneakers. I mean, I, I, I wanted to like screenshot that reading or whatever you do. Thank you, Walter. That was, that was a pleasure. Um, Charles or Caroline, do you fancy reading or is it not your cup of tea? I'm doing the British thing, see? I'll read a little bit of um, <clears throat> the first chapter. Um, this is the Langolan Valley, early spring, 1921. And to set the stage, uh, a young boy, 11, um, lost his father in the war. And he finds in the attic the fishing pole that he and his father used to use when he was five or six years old. And he decides to take it out. His grandmother and his stepmother 
are not very happy with this, but it's a Saturday and his um, um, school teacher is at home with a chest. On Saturday with no school and the schoolmaster ill with a chest, Roddy slipped away while his mom was having her usual late breakfast, took the fishing pole from the shed and went off to the river. The D here was within walking distance of the farm and Roddy found himself thinking about his pa and fishing. He had gone with his father a few times and still had a vague memory of what to do with the pole once the hook was affixed on the line and a worm was put into it. He surreptitiously, surreptitiously had dug wor some worms out of the kitchen garden last night and put them in a tin. Most had crawled out, but there were still three left. Whistling now, he could glimpse the river shining in the noon sun beyond the line of trees. And he told himself his father would be happy if he could see how tall his son had grown and only 12 and off to fish at last. The sun was warm, but under the trees there bare branches crossing over his head like the bones of wood holding up the roof of a church. Here the air was cooler, or perhaps it was the water. He could hear it and smell it now. He came out onto the bank, stiff with dried, dried grasses of winter, and stood looking down at the drifting current. Too steep here to fish, he thought, and moved downstream a little beyond the Telford Aqueduct soaring high above the valley. I'm skipping a little ahead. Ahead was the lower spot on the bank, and Roddy moved quickly towards it, eager to try out the pole and catch his fish. He didn't notice what was in the water, not at first. He wasn't interested in the river, only the pole. After two attempts, he got the line onto the pole, tied the hook to the end, and then pushed the wriggling worm onto the hook. On his first try at casting, he caught the bush behind him, untangled the line finally, and tried again. This time he managed better, and the hook actually sailed out over the water and sank into the sunny depths. Smiling, he wiggled the pole a little, felt it catch, and burst out laughing. He caught a fish, first thing. What would his pa think of that? But when he tried to pull the line in, it wouldn't come. And as he pulled harder, he saw something move in the water just below the surface. For where he stood, it appeared to be a rock or even a tangle of roots. Whatever it was, it bobbed a little as he went on pulling, harder now, desperate to save his only hook. And then it suddenly came free from whatever was holding it down. And as it did, a face rose slowly out of the water, a face unlike any other he had ever seen, white and torn and no longer human, like something the water had taken and haven't even wanted to give back. The lump of whatever it was attached to, the lump of whatever was attached to it rolled a little again, making the head move as well. And for an instant, Roddy thought that it was coming directly out of the water at him. He screamed as he dropped the pole and ran. But no one on the narrow boat crossing high above his head heard him cry. Oh my gosh, the contrast between childhood innocence and what's going to happen, that, that before and after line is so, so vivid. I mean, it almost reads like, like, like a touch of horror as well as the mystery that's to, to come. So thank you to all our authors for reading. And I forgot to show you my drink, everybody, but um, I, it's champagne because I was just so thrilled. I, this was a champagne worthy night for me. Um, I would, and so I really want to thank everybody for participating, Charles and Caroline and Walter and um, Ed and, and Dana. I know you had to hop off, but it was so, such an honor to get to talk with you. I hope we have time for some questions. Chris, should I jump over to the chat and read them? Or do you want to read a few of the questions? 
Most of the things people are writing are just comments about how much they loved it, how much they love hearing you read. Um, Readings were wonderful. If anybody out there has a question, we have a few minutes that we could certainly ask the question. And I also have another for each of the authors that we could do kind of a round robin with them. So if we don't have a question in the chat, Chris, I think I, I would love to ask my question for the authors. We do not have a question in the chat. Um, okay. So this will be for Walter and Ed and Charles and Caroline. Um, I feel like I still stuck to alphabetical order, hopefully there. Um, so as I said, with the Rogue Women Writers, we have a lot of emerging writers who follow the blogs and come to events like this. I would love to hear what each of you have to say for a writer who's just starting out today. And I know Ed touched on this a little bit. We should all write to the number one best-selling author and send him pages. But could you each speak a little bit about what advice you'd give to an emerging writer today? And we'll start with Walter, just to keep to our order. You know, I, I'm, 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 kind of, I, I'm very technical about, about writing because I think that, that it is, it's a very technical thing that, that we're, we're doing. And, and, and the technique has a lot to do with stuff that's buried inside of us, our, in our hearts, and our minds, and our unconscious, and our histories. And I find that the best way to, to get to, you know, what, what Clancy was talking about, uh, to, you know, to Ed is, is that um, write every day. You know, because a lot of people say, well, I, I want, I'm going to, what I do is I wait until my vacation, or I wait till the weekend, and I write all, you know, the whole weekend long, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I'm like, well, you know, if you just wrote like two hours every morning, you'd probably get more out of some gigantic, you know, blurb of time that, that you get to, to write, and that, and as long as you're writing, as long as things are coming out, uh, there's, a lot of hope, good hope, that uh, you're going to be one successful at what you're writing, and two, you'll have something to show to somebody else in order to get that something published. You'll be accumulating words and using the writer muscle more. Yeah, I think that's great. Thank you. Can we can we get some advice from Ed besides? Uh... Uh, I have to I have to agree with uh, Walter. You, you got to write every day, and you have to do it whether you're in the mood or you're not in the mood. You can try different things, um, but you have to write every day. It is a perishable skill, and you mm -hmm. only get better at it by doing it. Perishable skill. That is great. A skill with a shelf life. Charles and Caroline, advice for emerging new writers? Charles, you want to go first? Uh, I tend to think of writing as a craft in a lot of ways. Uh, and because it is a craft, I, I agree with what Ed and Walter said that it's like anything else, the more you do it, the better you get. And staying with it rather than trying to write a whole bunch all at once, because I, I think it's helpful by breaking it up, by spending a set amount of time every day, it also feeds in a certain amount of break where you can get away from it and then come back. If you try to write for 48 hours straight and then can't understand why when you look at it on Wednesday after it's been sitting for a while, you realize a lot of it's gobbledygook. The one thing that I firmly believe in is uh, finish a book. Uh, we've heard thousands of great ideas for books. We've read hundreds of first hundred pages of books. We've read first five chapters of books. But what you learn in actually taking a book and writing it from start to finish, maintaining that interest level, for God's sake, even for yourself to remain interested in the book all the way through to finishing it, uh, you'll learn a great deal. Just don't turn around and spend 10 years trying to rewrite the same book. Finish it, <laughs> move on. Yeah, I think that's great advice that by crossing that frontier and getting to the end, you do learn something that you can't by just starting multiple. 
but yeah, then you got to move on too. So great advice. Um, Caroline, do you want to add anything to that? Or you have a different take? I, I, I'm, I'm different. Um, I like when the spirit moves me. I'm not clear, but it, it, I understand what they mean by that. Um, I'm a night rider. Charles is a morning rider. And this works out very well for the two of us because we can compare notes and decide what we want to do and what not. But the best advice I think I could give to a, a, a young writer starting out, listen to your characters. So many times it's easy to decide what your characters are going to do. And then they become puppets. If you listen to them and find out what it is in them that makes them a part of the story and where they stand in the story and what they're going to bring to the story, you'll have a much better book. Um, we listen to our characters all the time and we, we find that they take us into places that we had no idea uh, we were going. We don't outline. And so listening to them is a... Um, is a way to see them as real people rather than your character doing what you want for your book. It's their book, listen to them. Yeah, I think that's great advice. You're not trying to jam your character into the plot like a square peg into a round hole. You're letting the character build and evolve. So well, great advice. I have a question, Jenny. I have a yeah. question. Um, and Carolyn, you brought it up when you said you don't plot. Um, how, how much do you plot, like Walter and Ed? I, I'm so impressed with your work, all of you. Um, and I sometimes plot and I sometimes don't and I sometimes get stuck and I sometimes um, freak out because I wished I knew what was going to allow how to get to the end. Um, and I just wonder if you have, if you do it all different ways or if you have a basic process that you go with. Well, I, I, I since I, you know, I, I'm, I'll answer what, what I think. I do the same thing. I, I, I do different things. Like, for instance, if I have a, a, a book that's due in, like I, somebody says, well, you need to deliver this book by February 15th, and it's March 1st, uh, I outline that book, and, and I write, you know, I try to follow the outline. Very often, it changes along the way, but still, you know, I, I, I know the general direction I'm going. If I don't have that, that limitation, I just start writing. Um, you know, I mean, I, plot is interesting. I mean, outline is one thing, you know, uh, which I think, you know, Caroline was saying she doesn't outline, but, but, but plot for me is I have a, a, an understanding of it. The plot is the structure of revelation, right? It has a pedestrian meaning and a kind of a highfalutin meaning at the same time. When you find out what is so important in any novel, it's, it's probably even more important than mysteries, but it's important in any novel so like to, to say you're reading it and you're reading the book because you want to find something out. Um, and that's, that's a kind of a, a wonderful, um, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience. So you're always going to, there's always going to be a plot. There isn't always going to be an outline. <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, you, the outline, you know, it's a collapsible structure, but the, but, uh, but uh, the plot is uh, in the end, it has to be there. Did you say a plot is the structure of revelation? That is, that is, that is, that's writer's gold there, folks. The structure of revelations. Um, Ed, as a military man, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that you do plot, uh, that you do outline, but am I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you'll teach me that we should not stereotype. Uh, no, I do outline. Uh, this play, a uh, big surprise, right? I'm an engineer, too. Um, this book and the previous one are, are mysteries. Uh, hold it up. Can uh, you hold it up? That comes of war. Um, I outline them. I, I start with the, the main idea, <clears throat> and then I build from there. Uh, and I actually write out um, um, probably a sixty-page outline uh, mm -hmm. for the whole thing to make sure if John gets shot in chapter two, he's still wounded in chapter seven, and 
uh, all those things because that stuff gets gets away from me sometimes. Um, I was thinking about some of the nonfiction stuff I've written. I don't think I plotted it. I, um, I'm thinking of one in particular, I followed in a group of people through the course of a year and I let them take the outline uh, of it, what, what was happening to them and, and allowed it to discover. Uh, but this one, because it's, these are mysteries and you, you have to reveal things at a certain time, I, I needed to outline them. So my own are very, very detailed, yeah. Yeah, so the nonfiction sounds sort of like what Caroline was describing with fiction, which is the characters drive the, uh, the shape and the form. The, but but uh, Ed, can, I, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, what you just said, because yeah, it, 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 there's a, a moment, you know, I always think that there's more truth in fiction than nonfiction, because in fiction, you put everything you intend to be in there. In nonfiction, you leave out 99% of whatever happened. And so, and I was just wondering, Ed, when, when, when you come back and you say, well, what part of this year of following around people am I going to put in the book? Does, does that kind of constitute a, a negative outline? A negative outline, meaning, meaning what? Well, what? because you left out things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess it does. Uh, I guess it does because you decide to not cover this and you cover this other thing. So you're deciding hard as it is, as much as I like that, and I might write it, uh, but you know, it, I have to leave it out. Yeah, it's like chipping away at the block of marble, and you're taking everything that isn't going to be. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Um, hey, so I have to admit, I still... yeah, Charles, I was just going to bounce to you. Uh, I started out as a, as a technical writer, writing handbooks and that type of thing in the corporate world. And uh, so the, the very concept of doing something without an outline was totally alien to me. But really, truly, we start with the first chapter, which lays the groundwork for what we're about to, to explore. And in a lot of cases, we have an idea of, of the goal, so to speak, not a specific plot or a specific destination, uh, but a, a goal of resolution, most definitely. I think the worst thing, especially in the mystery field that you could do is come up and say, ta-da, here's who did it. And your readers are like, I have no idea how you got there. You want them, it's a race between them, between us and the reader to see, we want to get there just before you do, but not so far ahead that you're not buying the story, so to speak. So uh, it, it, that goal of direction really makes a big difference. It's not like we just go in and meander with, with no real concept of where we're going. And the other thing is, is when you're dealing, especially with murder and what causes an ordinary person to murder, I still come back to the very basic concept of the seven deadly sins. Whenever you have a person resort to murder, at the heart of it, there's one of the seven deadly sins. Oh, that's interesting. That's a twist on the there's only 13 plots or there's only two plots or, you know, and you're saying there's only seven character motivations in a way. Um, well, like I say, this has been writer's goal. It always goes way too fast. I really want to encourage everybody to discover Charles Todd's works, Charles Todd's work with his mother, um, if you haven't already, Walter Mosley, Dana Stabenow, Ed Regal. Their new books are Blood Grove, Comes the War, Spoils of the Dead, and A Fatal Lie. Great titles, all of them. I also want to tell everybody to tune in next time on March 22nd for Rogue Reads. Our lineup is going to be almost as good as, no, it's going to be, it's going to be fantastic. CJ Box, Lisa Gardner, Alex Finley, and a debut author, Allison Epstein, and host Lisa Black, one of the rogues. So I hope everybody has had a wonderful time tonight. If you've had half as much fun as I have, you've had a really good Ooh. hour and uh, 20 minutes. And a big thank you to Charles, Caroline, to Ed, to Walter, to Dana. You know, if you ever click back on to post this or something, it's, it's just been wonderful and an honor to be here. So 
Thank you, and yay, Thank Rogue you. Women Writers. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for coming so much. Oh, our pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs>